The Committee on Homeland Security will come to order. The committee is meeting today to receive testimony from Secretary Janet Napolitano on the President's FY 2010 budget request for the Department of Homeland Security. I want to thank Secretary Napolitano for being here today to testify in support of the President's fiscal year 2010 budget request for the Department. The transition period for the Obama administration has been very busy and on many fronts. From border violence to the recent flu outbreak, the Department has had a lot on its plate. Yet, you've still managed to submit a very comprehensive budget that answers a lot of the questions we've had about where the Department wants to go. Last week, the President's budget, just over $55 billion, was requested for the Department of Homeland Security. This is an increase of $2.6 billion over last year. Within that request, the President is seeking about $43 billion in appropriations. This represents an increase of 6.6 percent over last year and will cover key investments in Homeland Security in a range of areas including the following, $121 million in funding for explosive detection, an additional $96 million for southbound firearms and currency smuggling enforcement, $420 million for safer firefighter grant program, an additional $75 million for the DHS headquarters project. I believe that funding sought for the department will benefit this vital agency. Additionally, the budget includes a number of critical programmatic changes that I support and would like to highlight here. The transfer of the Office of Intergovernmental Programs to the Office of the Secretary is a long time coming and will surely enhance DHS's ability to coordinate with state, local, and tribal governments. I also support moving the Federal Protective Service from ICE to the National Protection and Programs Directorate, the Center of Gravity for Infrastructure Protection at DHS. The $75 million increase slated for the Comprehensive National Cybersecurity Initiative is another step in the right direction. Although I agree overall with the President's request for the Department, I do have some concerns. In previous years, over 40 percent of DHS's budget went out the door to contractors to perform a host of functions, including policymaking. This over-reliance on contractors has undermined DHS's ability to execute its missions. I'm hopeful that through your efficiency review, Madam Secretary, we will start to see some progress in this area. While overall funding for grant programs seem in line with past budgets, I'm concerned about the significant decrease plan for the fire grant program. As a volunteer firefighter, I know how much communities rely on this critical program. In these tough economic times, I'm committed to working to help secure a budget for the department that keeps on our commitment to fiscal responsibility while strengthening the security of our nation. I'm also committed to executing my legislative responsibility and producing authorization legislation to give DHS the resources and authorities it needs to execute all its missions. Tomorrow, the committee is moving its first piece of authorization legislation for FY 2010. The TSA Authorization Act is a product of extensive bipartisan discussions. It reflects input from members, GAO, Inspector General, and transportation stakeholders from across the spectrum. Regrettably, input from TSA was hard to come by. With no Senate-confirmed leader at the head of TSA, the agency has not been the partner that we had hoped to have. Madam Secretary, I appreciate the challenges that this vacancy creates for you on an operational level, and I'm eager to see a strong manager installed in this critical position. Please keep in mind that the delays in filling key positions throughout the department not only makes things difficult for you, but also complicate this committee's ability to carry out its oversight and legislative responsibilities. I look forward to 
foregoing a collaborative uh, relationship with you and the new leadership at DHS. This committee has years of knowledge and experience on a range of issues that you face. Please look to us as a resource as you consider Homeland Security challenges. In closing, Madam Secretary, I look forward to working with you to ensure that the department has the resources it needs to execute all its missions, including to prevent and respond to the threat of terrorism. Thank you, and I look forward to your testimony. The chair now recognizes the ranking member of the full committee, the gentleman from New York, Mr. King, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, Madam Secretary. It's good to see you here today. At the uh, outset, let me uh, uh, express some very positive notes. One, I want to thank you for your level of cooperation and contact, uh, certainly with my office and I'm sure with other members as well. I must tell you, though, you do cause trauma among my staff when they realize that you on the phone, that there's no intermediary, so go a little easy on them, okay? They're not, they're not expecting that. Uh, also, on the issue of swine flu, you're very cooperative and, you know, uh, keeping us abreast of what was happening. And on the uh, issue of the uh, first report to come out on the uh, right-wing extremists uh, turning veterans, I very much appreciate your personal call to me on that in discussing it. Having said that, uh, I believe that the combination of the first report and then the second report, which I know was called back to me and to others, certainly on this side, does demonstrate, we believe, a weakness in the department which has to be addressed, and we certainly look forward to what you have to say about that and working with you on that because it's raised very significant issues. Certainly back in our districts, we hear about it. It's made an impression. I don't think it reflects well in the department. I know you want to address it, but I would like to really hear what your plans are and how those were released and what caused them to be uh, brought about. Uh, also, uh, the chairman has mentioned the issue of the uh, fire grants, a 70 percent cut in the fire grants. Uh, this, I can assure you, is a bipartisan issue. Uh, there's tremendous concern over this. I'm certainly hearing from uh, fire districts. Uh, I am uh, chairman of the Congressional Fire Caucus, and uh, I believe last year there was over $3 billion in uh, fire grants, which shows the real need for it and demand for it. And so, again, uh, that is an, uh, an issue that certainly we have to work together on and which I'll be very much looking forward to your testimony on. Uh, also on the uh, Secure the Cities, which was a three-year pilot program, and while the program was primarily in New York City, this is something that affects cities throughout the country. And it's a uh, pilot program, which for the most part worked. I believe still more has to be done on it, so I don't believe the pilot program, even in the pilot stage, has been completed. But the fact is that when we look overseas, Madrid and London, it's very likely that the next attack on a major city is going to be launched from outside the city, from suburban areas, from areas outside the city, which is why it's so essential that we have uh, radiation detection, that we have comprehensive efforts. So, for instance, the uh, Secure the Cities pilot program uh, in New York, which is being zeroed out, is being ended, uh, involved not just New York City. It was New York City, it was Long Island, it was Westchester, Rockland, it was New Jersey, it was Connecticut. It was a regional defense against radioactive uh, uh, attack. And I saw a, an anonymous quote in the Washington Post from somebody in the Department of Homeland Security saying one of the reasons this program was eliminated was because uh, the department did not want to be a goal line defense, that we wanted to stop the nuclear weapons from coming, going, get, uh, getting them overseas before they got here. But one of the reasons the department was set up was to be a goal line defense. If everything was being done well overseas, we wouldn't have to have the Department of Homeland Security, certainly not to the extent that we do. And also, you don't need a bomb coming from Pakistan to impact New York City or Los Angeles or Chicago. It can be radioactive material stolen from a hospital, which could create a dirty bomb, which could devastate our uh, financial sectors, devastate neighborhoods and communities. So again, I certainly want to discuss that with you. On the issue of immigration, uh, I have real concerns that the SCAP program is being eliminated. I even remember some former governors telling us how important that program was uh, in the uh, fight against illegal immigration. And again, uh, I think this is something that really has to be addressed, and I, I believe there's strong bipartisan support for the uh, SCAP program. Uh, on the issue of Guantanamo, uh, I know uh, we've sent a letter to you asking what precautions the department is going to make. Uh, there have been various news reports, whether it involves the Uyghurs going into Virginia, uh, whether it involves uh, prisoners or detainees being brought to the Southern District of New York for trial in Northern Virginia as to what measures are going to be taken if that does happen to provide the security it's needed to do what has to be done because this to me is uh, going to make uh, already uh, prime targets even more targets and create much more uh, 
security problems for us. So I uh, want to, again, commend you for reaching out. But again, there are some real questions here which have to be addressed, and certainly on uh, fire grants, on secure the cities, on immigration, and the whole issue of the unit in your department which uh, issued these reports, and also what we're going to do about Guantanamo if, in fact, detainees are brought to the United States either for trial or even to be released, as has been heard in some cases. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. Uh, thank you, Mr. King. Other members of the committee are reminded that under committee rules, opening statements may be submitted for the record. Again, I welcome our witness today. Janet Napolitano is the third Secretary of the Department of Homeland Security. I'd like to publicly commend you, Madam Secretary, for your leadership uh, at, for the, the three months, especially your handling of the recent influenza outbreak. Prior to joining this administration, Secretary Napolitano was midway through her second term as governor of Arizona. As governor, she implemented one of the first state homeland security strategies in the nation, opened the first state counterterrorism center, and spearheaded efforts to transform immigration enforcement. Secretary Napolitano previously served as the Attorney General of Arizona and the U.S. Attorney for the District of Arizona. Madam Secretary, I thank you for your service and for appearing before this committee today. Without objection, the witness's full statement will be inserted into the record. Uh, Secretary Napolitano, I now recognize you to summarize your statement for the committee for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative King, members of the committee. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to testify on the Department of Homeland Security portion of President Obama's budget proposal for FY 2010. The proposed total budget for DHS is $55.1 billion, which includes $42.7 billion in appropriated funding. DHS performs a broad range of activities across a single driving mission to secure America from the entire range of threats that we face. The Department's leadership in the past couple of weeks in response to the H1N1 flu outbreak only proves the breadth of the Department's portfolio, as well as the need to make DHS a stronger, more effective Department. This budget strengthens our efforts in what I see as the five main mission areas where we need to focus in order to secure the American people. First, guarding against terrorism, the founding purpose and perennial top priority of the department. Second, securing our borders, an effort even more urgent as the United States looks to do its part to counter a rise in cartel violence in Mexico. Third, smart and effective enforcement of our immigration laws. We want to facilitate legal immigration and pursue enforcement against those who violate our country's immigration laws. Next, improving our preparation for, response to, and recoveries from disasters. Not just hurricanes and tornadoes, but also unexpected situations like the outbreak of the H1N1 flu. And lastly, unifying, creating one Department of Homeland Security. We need to work together as one department to ensure that we operate at full strength. As this committee knows, the department was recently created out of uh, 22 separate agencies. So part of this budget is designed to help us uh, continue to knit and unify into one DHS. Now there are three approaches uh, that the department is taking to strengthen its performance in each of the five main mission areas and that are also strengthened in this budget. First, expanding partnerships with state, local, and tribal governments, the first detectors and the first responders. Second, bolstering our science and technology portfolio, investing in new technologies that can increase our capabilities while being very cognizant of privacy and other interests that are there. And third, maximizing efficiency. Through an efficiency review initiative that we launched in March, we intend to ensure that every security dollar is spent in the most effective way. This budget adheres to the President's main reform goals government efficiency, transparency, and cohesion, and will play a major part in bringing about a culture of responsibility and fiscal discipline at DHS. The DHS budget was based on alignment with the department programs and priorities 
and that was assessed on the basis of effectiveness and risk. In terms of budget priorities to guard against terrorism, this budget proposal includes $121 million to fund research for new technologies that detect explosives in public places and transportation networks, $87 million for new measures to protect critical infrastructure and cyber networks from attack, and it also enhances information sharing among federal, state, local, and tribal law enforcement. For border security, the budget proposal includes $116 million to deploy additional staff and technology to the southwest border to disrupt southbound smuggling of drugs and bulk cash to help combat cartel violence. It also includes $40 million for smart security technology funding on the northern border to expand and integrate surveillance systems there. To assure smart, effective enforcement of our immigration laws, this budget proposal includes $112 million to strengthen E-Verify to help employers maintain a legal workforce, a total of $198 million for the Secure Communities Program, which helps state, local, and tribal law enforcement target criminal aliens, and it improves security and facilitates trade and tourism through the Western Hemisphere Tribal and, uh, <laughs> Travel Initiative, $145 million, and $344 million to U.S. visit. To help Americans prepare for uh, and recover from natural disaster, the budget proposal includes doubling the funds from 210 to 420 million dollars to increase the number of frontline firefighters, a 600 million dollar increase to the disaster relief fund, and it strengthens pre-disaster hazard mitigation efforts to reduce injury, loss of life, and destruction of property. Finally, to unify the department, this budget proposal includes $79 million for the consolidation of DHS headquarters, which will bring 35 disparate offices together, generating significant savings in the long run. It also includes $200 million to consolidate and unify our IT infrastructure and bring all of DHS under the same system. In my few months as Secretary, I've seen a number of remarkable accomplishments in addition to challenges that DHS faces. I have seen this department's potential. I believe we have a path toward realizing it. We are aiming to do even better at achieving our nation's security mission, and this budget will help the department do just that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Madam Secretary. I thank you for your testimony. I will remind each member that he or she will have five minutes to question the secretary. I now recognize myself uh, for the first question. Uh, Madam Secretary, um, recent reports have indicated that some 5,000 families across Mississippi and Louisiana uh, will have to leave their FEMA trailers at the end of this month. Uh, uh, with that, uh, I have been unsuccessful in figuring out the plan for those 5,000 families. Can you assure this committee that there will be a plan for those uh, individuals who are presently housed in those trailers soon to be displaced? Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman. Let me just begin by saying that uh, we have uh, placed over 100,000 families uh, already. These are the last remaining five. Uh, I'd be happy to supply you with a list, uh, extensive uh, contact with the families, options they've been given. Uh, and also share with you that we offered to give the state of Louisiana, the state's additional workers, case workers, to work with those families, because this goes through the state to work uh, through the families. Uh, they did not uh, accept that offer. Uh, but uh, it is now time to, to start closing out uh, the remains of Katrina. Uh, and we are and do have uh, many options that have been made available to those occupants. Well, and a uh, couple with that is uh, this committee's real interest on just the, the housing of individuals with uh, uh, natural disasters. Uh, some of the numbers associated with it have been astronomical. And uh, uh, Chairman Carney and a couple of us are planning to uh, look at the whole uh, temporary housing issue. Um, uh, some of the $60,000 costs associated with one temporary uh, trailer is a lot of money. 
And uh, the only answer we've been able to get uh, is, well, this is, we've always done it this way. So I'm hoping that you will look at that going forward and see what are alternatives uh, that can be explored uh, in that temporary housing arena. Mr. Chairman, one of the first meetings I had as Secretary of, was with the Secretary of HUD, Sean Donovan, because there is not a clean uh, connection uh, in terms of housing uh, for uh, disaster victims. Uh, and we are looking at some point when the, after the immediate response of temporary housing, uh, these have become long-term housing issues. And what this has revealed is that long-term recovery planning uh, is not as robust uh, as it needs to be. So housing is part of that. And yes, indeed, we are working very hard at, on those issues. Another issue around procurement, Madam Secretary, is the fact that um, presently DHS has over 15,000 contractors. That's some 300% increase since the department uh, was created. Uh, can you uh, share with the committee uh, whether or not there's a plan to reduce the over-reliance on outside contractors for the department? Yes, Mr. Chairman, one of the management things we will be doing this year uh, and uh, probably will be reflected in the 011 budget um, is um, uh, really looking at contractors and what needs to be brought in house. I think the committee understands that contractors were used at the outset because of the speed with which the department had to get up and running. Uh, but uh, uh, now, as you note, uh, there's an over-reliance there and uh, what the what the committee needs to know and appropriators need to know is what do we really need in-house to properly staff some of these functions. So yes, we are uh, looking at that from a management standpoint. So your testimony is that not this year, but next year? I, I think it would be uh, fair to say that the FY10 budget uh, has some changes in it uh, already, but uh, looking at the contractor issue simply requires more time than we had available. Um, with respect to uh, compliance with detention standards and ICE. Uh, a number of reports have talked about some pretty um, devastating things occurring uh, with respect to um, medical care in facilities. Uh, some have led to multiple deaths. Um, and looking at this budget, it appears that we will expand uh, detention facilities. Uh, what have you uh, taken to prevent some of those issues medically from reoccurring? Mr. Chairman, one of the things I discovered when I took over the department that uh, within the huge organizational chart that it has, uh, the whole issue of where detention was was at the very, very bottom. Uh, we have uh, moved that up so it's a, a person who reports directly to the head of ICE and brought in uh, to, to help us there uh, a, a person who has run the prison systems in Missouri and Arizona, extensive experience with these types of facilities. She has been going uh, facility by facility, contract by contract, looking at what we have. Uh, the budget reflects the, the, uh, not only the need for beds, but the need to increase the expenditure for health care to reach uh, uh, standards for uh, detainees. And so uh, we are uh, in the process of, of doing that right now as well. Thank you. Uh, ends my question. I now recognize the ranking member of the full committee, the gentleman from New York, for question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Madam Secretary, I would like to cover issues of Secure the Cities, fire grants, and immigration. How far I'll get, I don't know, but I'll start with Secure the Cities. Uh, and not from the parochial perspective of New York City, but really what this means for other cities throughout the country. And I realize this was a pilot program. I don't believe it's really been completed. I know from talking to the NYPD and other police departments, they feel there's still more that has to be done even in the pilot phase of it. But even if it were finished, I think it's really rolling the dice to be asking uh, cities across the country to be applying for grants every year. I think there should really be a dedicated revenue stream. That's good. I just see this as being such a real threat to our cities. And I'm not aware of anything, for instance, of any federal officials being on highways or parkways or roadways leading from suburbs into the cities 
who are doing radiation detecting, detection. This is going to be left to the cities to do. And it's, it really requires a regional approach. And to that extent, I believe that the uh, detection and uh, interdiction infrastructure that was set up in New York is a model that can be used and should have a dedicated revenue stream. And to me, to zero it out or to end it just because a three-year pilot program is over, uh, to me, is really missing the larger picture. And I would appreciate your thoughts on that, especially since if we look at Europe, generally the attacks come from the suburbs into the cities. Uh, yeah, thank you, uh, Mr. Um, on Secure the Cities, uh, I couldn't agree with you more that protection of uh, the country from a radiation uh, attack is, is key, a very important mission. This particular grant, I, I think uh, I should share with you that the recipient has not yet spent the FY08 money that it got. It has not yet submitted its grant application for the FY09 money that it got. So there is money in the pipeline uh, to continue uh, and fulfill uh, the grant through FY10. Um, and so it was the judgment that we shouldn't put more new money in it because there was money that would fund the program uh, through this fiscal year. And, and as I think we all recognize, uh, money is very tight this year. And what we're trying to do is if we have unspent monies, well, we'll use those as opposed to asking for, for others. With respect to continuation of the pilot permanently, I think that's worthy of consideration once we see how it works. Uh, obviously, um, New York, uh, uh, the other states participating could, could apply to some of the other pre-existing grant programs and, and use those funds uh, for the Secure the Cities uh, uh, operation. Uh, but moving forward, as a, one of the things we want to know from a pilot is does it work and does it make sense to make it permanent and expand it, and we will, and we will evaluate it. Okay. Uh with the previous uh, administration, with Secretary Shartsoff, we had this disagreement one year about whether or not the grant application was in or was not, uh, and whether or not there was money available or not. Rather than lose because of bookkeeping tactics, I would ask if you'd be willing to meet with officials involved in the New York Secure the Cities program or people in your office to meet to make sure that this can be continued over the next year without any damage being done. Because again, I sort of went through this three years ago with Secretary Shartoff, and it was a question of whether or not the grant was in on time, whether the form was filled out correctly. In the meantime, tens of millions of dollars were lost. So rather than go through that again, I would really ask if, if I could, or if you could, you know, be willing to meet with them to make sure that everyone's on the same page on this. And again, not for the parochial interests of New York, but I just see the, our cities across the nation being being a you know, yeah. threat because of this. Oh, absolutely. Yes. And uh, we'll work with your staff to make sure we're talking to the, the, the people you would like us to speak with. Thank you, Secretary. On the issue of the uh, uh, fire grants, uh, I think of all the programs administered by the department, I don't think any received a, a, a higher rating, both being effective, uh, and yet there's going to be a 70 percent cut. And uh, I believe you testified yesterday that your uh, belief in the fire departments is they needed more personnel as opposed to equipment and training. Uh, again, when you have over $3 billion being applied for in uh, uh, under the fire grants, and certainly from my contact with fire districts, uh, not just in my state but around the country, uh, I think there's a real demand for this, uh, a real necessity. And uh, again, you know, the role of the fire service has also changed since September 11th. They are in also become first line defenders, certainly again in areas which are uh, target rich. And so I would, uh, I think you're going to be hearing from us on that in a bipartisan way. I promise you, I will try to restrain Congressman Pasquale when he gets going, but... Uh, <laughs> well, he's looking at me right now. <laughs> but uh, seriously, on that, again, that's something, uh, again, I, hear what, I uh, look forward to hearing what you have to say on it, but also I think it's going to be you know, part of an ongoing dialogue. Uh, thank, thank you. Yes, uh, uh, well, there was money in the Stimulus Act for the fire grants, and the fire grants have been heavily funded in the past years, as, as you uh, recognize, kind of two to one uh, compared to what are called the safer grants, which really go for firefighters themselves. Uh, our analysis was, and our contacts were, that in this era of very restricted local budgets uh, and, and departments having to lay off firefighters, that they really uh, wanted some money to, to, keep, to, to keep their personnel numbers up. And so the judgment was made, given that the Congress already had put money for the safer grants and the stimulus bill, um, was to uh, significantly now plus up uh, the fire grants during this economic period so that we wouldn't have fire department layoffs. I couldn't agree with you more. Fire departments now are not just about fire. Uh, they're about a much broader range of first response. Uh, and so we want to make sure they're supported in that capacity. 
see my time has uh, run out. I'm sure somebody will mention SCAP to you before the hearing is over. Thank you. Thank you, sir. The chair will now recognize other members for questions they may wish to ask the secretary. Again, I urge members to be mindful of the five-minute rule and the secretary's limited time with the committee today. In accordance with our committee rules, I recognize members who are present at the start of the hearing based on seniority on the committee, alternating between majority and minority. Those members coming in later will be recognized in the order of their arrival. The chair now recognizes the gentleman from Oregon uh, for five minutes, Mr. DePazio. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Madam Secretary. Uh, three uh, questions, hopefully, we can dispose of quickly. Uh, I asked the former, uh, there, I, I think you would, unlike the former administration, recognize that the Constitution provides for three branches of government. Do you, do you, you agree with that? I, I can agree with that. That's yes. good. Thank you. That was controversial with the previous administration. Um, we are one of the three. Uh, there was a, a plan uh, for continuity of government, and one would assume that continuity of government would include all three branches. Um, do you agree with that? I, I, I would agree with that. Excellent. Yes. Good. We're off to a good start here. Uh, they, I'm a member of this committee, um, and the chairman and I requested uh, to be uh, uh, to have access to that plan to understand what was the proposed role for our branch of government uh, and what provisions were to be made in terms of continuity of government after a either a catastrophic attack or other uh, problems. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, this executive order is still uh, in place and is still uh, classified and we were denied access. Uh, could you provide us access to that so we might better understand uh, the proposal? Yeah, I'm you look puzzled. Yes, I am puzzled, yeah, okay. um, but I will look into this and report back to you, yes. Thank you. That would be, it started a whole little uh, cottage business on the internet about what might or might not be in it because of the fact that uh, even the chairman and I were denied access to it and, and other members of Congress. So. It, it surprises me that the legislative branch uh, has not developed its own continuity of operations. Well, I, and there is, there is certainly concern there, and Brian Baird, one of my colleagues from Washington State, has proposals on how we might reconstitute ourselves in the case of a, uh, a devastating attack and loss of membership, and uh, thus far it's not gone anywhere. But I would just be curious how we fit into this overall plan of the executive branch. Uh, secondly, uh, last time you were here, I asked about the issue of collective uh, bargaining rights. Uh, are you were going to uh, consult uh, on that. Have we made progress on that issue for TSA employees? Yes, we are still uh, looking at that, as well as in addition to collective bargaining rights, how do we create within TSA a real career path for employees mm -hmm. so that we improve retention, take advantage of experience, allow kind of frontline uh, employees to move up into, uh, into the department, how we increase and improve training and so forth for those employees. So yes, we are looking at all those issues. Uh, we do not yet have a nominee to head TSA. Right. And, uh, uh, frankly, um, I think uh, some of these resolutions won't, will, are waiting at the new head of TSA. Okay. Hopefully that will uh, happen soon, uh, but I would agree with you in, as uh, when we then created the uh, uh, TSA over on the Aviation Committee where I then served, our, our idea was to move away from the you know, lowest cost, minimum wage, high turnover, you know, dead end jobs. I mean, we actually had testimony one year from the screener of the year who said that uh, at his airport, St. Louis, which had more than 100 percent turnover in terms of screening employees before the federal government took over, that it was considered a big move up to go to McDonald's uh, from uh, screening. And uh, we tried to fix that by creating the TSA, and I applaud your idea about a career path and enhanced training. That's excellent. Uh, finally, uh, there is a, a leaked uh, document uh, which talks about the Secure Freight Initiative, uh, and uh, it uh, acknowledges, which I think has been publicly acknowledged, the fact that uh, we're not, uh, you don't anticipate being able to meet the 100% scanning of inbound maritime cargo uh, by the 2012 deadline, and it, and it sets out three paths uh, to deal with that. Uh, do you have uh, thoughts on what path uh, is going to be chosen by the department in terms of uh, either meeting or not meeting that deadline for 100% screening of maritime cargo? Um, we are still looking at that. I think I said even in my confirmation hearing and in my first hearing before this committee 
that I thought the 2012 deadline for SFI was going to be very difficult to, uh, to reach, to negotiate all the international agreements that are part of that. Um, and we wanted to uh, really focus on what is the most effective way to prevent dangerous cargo from entering the United States with kind of a multi-layered uh, risk-based approach. Um, and so that is where uh, we are heading now within the context of SFI. Uh, but with respect to uh, the memo that uh, somehow uh, became a public document, um, we, we're still evaluating alternatives and have some meetings within the department to discuss them. Okay, well, my personal preference would be strategy three. Uh, you know, I am concerned that this is the most likely method of delivery of a weapon of mass destruction in the United States. And, uh, the current layered or risk-based program uh, we've pointed to in a number of hearings before your tenure uh, is rather loophole-ridden, and, uh, and and I would not put great faith in that we are properly identifying and or uh, you know providing additional scrutiny to cargo uh, with that system that that requires it. So thank you, Madam Secretary. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Now I recognize the gentleman from Indiana, Mr. Souter, for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Secretary. I have some questions related to the border, but first I, I wanted to touch briefly because we haven't had a chance to talk about the so-called FEMA trailers that Elkhart, Indiana is where many of these came from in, in my district and in Joe Donnelly's, and that uh, we've had multiple hearings here and over in government reform, and I, I want to make sure that you're aware of a, a few uh, facts related to what's come out. One is, is that formaldehyde in the room of the government reform hearing was higher than it was in the trailers. That the housing in Louisiana, in average, was higher than the FEMA trailers. That uh, the California standards, you can make a safe, if, you, if the industry is moving to this, you can make a safe trailer. FEMA is the only agency right now that's being unreasonable. That in reality, a tent has more formaldehyde in it. There is no housing that you can put people in, and we need to have a reasonable standard uh, that, by the way, since Katrina, there are people living in the same trailers in Florida, in places all over America. They've had zero complaints anywhere in America since Katrina. We have to have real science here, not emotion, or we're not going to be able to handle people, and I hope that you can approach this. Uh, Chairman Frank uh, understands a lot of this as he sat through some of this, too, and we can work out a reasonable thing. We can actually build affordable things that are safe if we stick with science and not emotion, and I wanted to I couldn't agree okay. with you more. That um, uh, now on, on the border, there are uh, one is a, a concern uh, on on terrorism in the border. If we're going to work out anything in this country on immigration, we have to have the confidence of American people that whether it's the Dream Act or whether it's an immigration reform of some type, that the border is secure, uh, or other people will just pour in uh, if we make changes. Uh, furthermore, if we're going to you know fight terrorism, we have to know who people are. So two basic questions. One is, you stated that you wanted to eliminate the real repeal the Real ID Act, which was one of the key 9-11 commissions. And do you still stand with that? Do you see that moving ahead? And how is that working? And if I can do the second, and then you can kind of work these together. Sure. On the border, uh, you, you stated that uh, you're putting resources in, but there's basically uh, no increase at all in SBI net technology in the, th that side. The increase was for maintenance of the existing. There doesn't appear to be any money for additional fencing. And it, the fundamental question is, do you intend to extend operational control past the 815 miles? You have plus ups for outbound, which is really important on narcotics and, and guns. You're plussing up, I, I think the total was 44 new border agents, uh, border patrol, but those are focused uh, in the, in, at the ports of entry. Uh, the question is, is for operational control of the border, do you have anything in your budget, uh, and why is there not more for SBI net uh, fencing and other things in between the ports of entry? Whether it be hard fencing or electronic fencing, it doesn't appear that you're looking past 815 miles. Uh, uh, thank you, Congressman. Let me address the questions in order. In terms of real ID, as I think the committee recognizes, Governors across the country, both parties, all thought Real ID was an unfunded mandate uh, from the Congress. Uh, I actually signed a bill in Arizona, opting Arizona out of Real ID because there was no money associated with it, and the way the regs were coming down, it was going to be a, a very big burden. Uh, it was that was 
almost uh, the, the strongest bipartisan vote amongst the nation's governors that I saw in my time as governor. So when I came here, I said, look, we need to get to what the 9-11 Commission was getting at, which is a more secure driver's license, all right? Uh, so we have been working with a, a team or governors at, at the NGA level uh, in a bipartisan fashion to craft a substitute for real ID. Uh, and there is a proposal now, I believe either it has been or will be introduced in, a, uh, in the Senate, I think it will have bipartisan sponsorship that the governors will accept and will be able to implement. So uh, it's not just a matter of repealing real ID, which nobody was going to do, uh, it's a matter of giving uh, the governors of the country a, a bill that they can actually implement given the way motor vehicle departments work and the like. So that's uh, where we are with that. With respect to SBI net, uh, we have just uh, a week or two ago approved the latest iteration uh, of it. As you know, when it was getting up and started, it, it took a while. It was a lot more complicated than people, I think, conceive. Uh, but that first operational part will go down at, at about, about 20 eight miles or so in southern Arizona in the Tucson sector. The next sector is on the way. The reason the budget is the way it is is because there are unspent monies, but there is a spend plan for SBI net. It's an integral part of our plans going forward because I believe that a border has to be secured. You have to have operational control over it. It requires manpower and technology, uh, particularly technology between the ports of entry. With respect to fencing, you are correct. We did not ask for fencing per se in large uh, miles across the border, but uh, I can anticipate there will be projects along the border that will incorporate some fencing as part of the tactical infrastructure. That so do you ex see extending past 815 miles? On a project basis, yes, but I, I would not say we intend to build a fence from San Diego to Brownsville. Uh, I meant electronic or other. Is it? Are you saying you'll get to 850 this year? Or, I mean, we're talking about a 3,000-mile border. When are we going to... Uh, there's, there is going to be a combination of manpower technology and infrastructure, and our goal obviously is to have a system border-wide, but not just to have a physical fence border-wide. The uh, gentleman from Texas for five minutes, Mr. Cuellar. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Madam Secretary, it's a pleasure seeing you again. One of the most important powers that we as members of the legislature have is, is, uh, is a legislative oversight. There's always a tension between the executive branch and the legislative body in, in this area. Uh, and most of the secretaries that we've had, they're either governors, uh, attorney generals, judges, uh, and that type of experience. So I can understand that there's always a tension. But w when we do ask for information, and there might be an issue as to when we get it, uh, but we do expect to get that information. One of the things that we asked, and Mr. Chairman, you recall the former secretary, we asked them to give us a uh, best estimate as to how many custom border protection folks they would eat on the ports of entry. Uh, and the infrastructure. And I think we waited about 14 months and we never got it. Uh, recently we made a request to your office also, um, um, to your department, and we're hoping we can try to get that information. And the reason we want that because we want to see how we can help you. It's not a got you type of situation, but we're trying to say, you know, how many people do you need, in, you know, men and women in blue, so we can try to fund that as much as possible. We need the infrastructure needs, both the north and south bound, so we can uh, reduce the, the wait times and move traffic, and especially since 80% of all the trade coming into the U.S. is through land ports, I think we need to do a lot more in that area. Uh, so do you have a general idea of when we could get that information from you? And this is something that both the chairman and I requested of the former secretary, and we could not get that information. Yeah. I'll have to, I don't know what the actual request is, uh, but our goal has been to, to be as uh, communicative and as cooperative as, as we humanly can with the committee. So uh, uh, we will, uh, I will find that request and, and, and see uh, what we can do and how quickly we can do it. Okay. The, the, the request is very simple. What proper staffing do you need? Uh, what would be the number of personnel you need to staff properly your, your ports of entry? The, the men and women in blue, one. And then what are your infrastructure needs you need for north and southbound? Very simple uh, on that. And Mr. Chairman, you recall we kept asking the other secretary and we couldn't get that information. It was not to try to catch somebody. We we're trying to say, what do you need so we can try to work on try to get you the proper funding um, on that? The other thing is I'm very interested in um, 
uh, uh, performance measures, uh, the efficiencies, and, and, and I understand that you're doing some of that. Uh, that part is important because if you have contractors, you'd like to see their performance measures because a lot of times what agencies do is they have certain performance measures for the agencies, but when they contract out, those performance measures drop out. So uh, we, we'd like to see the performance measures even on the contractors as you reduce them. And the efficiencies on, on some of the things that are done, for example, why is it that, as an example in Laredo, uh, when property is seized and they're going through the administrative process, they used to store that property in a Laredo warehouse. And it doesn't matter where, Laredo, El Paso, but now under the contract that they have, everything is shipped all the way to California. It's good for, for the California folks to have that, but the efficiency is, why, why do we, you know, why do people have to pay all this transportation costs to send something all the way up to California instead of keeping it in a local place, whether it's El Paso, Brownsville, or somewhere else? And I would like to get an answer if, if that contract is still in place or if you all plan to move, uh, make some changes on the efficiencies uh, on something like that. Efficiencies like, can we use more civilians to do support services instead of having customs border protection uh, you know, I'd rather have them out there on the lines trying to move traffic faster instead of them behind, behind some computer or typewriter uh, to do some of that support services. We did that in Texas with the DPS, and we got more people out, more, what we call more boots out in the field instead of having them do the support services, and, 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 and we hired more of those civilians. So I would like to see if we can follow up on that. Finally, the last thing is, is the, uh, on the FEMA grants, uh, what efforts are you all doing to uh, streamline the process? Uh, I know there's a question as to the cuts, but the streamline process, uh, paperwork uh, reduction, how fast we get it out in the areas, what do you do, how do you handle those small rural areas like the New York's or the Houston's or the Laredo can handle the paperwork, but the small rural volunteer areas, they have a hard time trying to fill those out, but the streamlining and simplifications of that would go a long way on those FEMA grants. Uh, th thank you, Congressman, and, and, and yes, we are. Uh, Excuse me a minute, Madam Secretary. I'm trying to listen to the Secretary. If, if the members could uh, be a little quieter, we could, we could hear. Go ahead, Madam Secretary. Uh, with respect to streamlining uh, FEMA, you're, you're talking about uh, public assistance grants, individual assistance grants in the wake of a natural uh, disaster. Uh, yes, and, and we have been working with communities and uh, even in my short tenure as secretary, uh, have been able to work with uh, uh, re relatively small communities to help them uh, with that process. Um, and we're always looking for ways to make it simpler and to streamline it. You're absolutely correct. Thank you. Uh, if I, Madam Secretary, I have some other questions that gentleman from uh, Texas uh, raised, and I'm sure uh, he would want to get them responded to uh, if we can, uh, if the gentleman is still of the mind to get all the questions answered. I would love to get, uh, I think you responded to the last one, but we had on the efficiency issues, if you, can, if you all. Well, uh, uh, with respect to efficiency measures for contractors, yes, as I uh, indicated to the chairman, I think the department now is at a stage where we really need to thoroughly review contractors versus full-time employees uh, moving forward as a department. And obviously part of that is, is what, what's the best and most effective way to spend the security dollars that we do get. Um, and so those performance measures are going to have to be and are going to have to be an integral part of that uh, evaluation. Okay. And then with respect to the first question, uh, I think I already indicated that I'm going to go back and, and see the request and, and, we'll, and uh, see, see when we can get you a response. Could, could you uh, give that response to that two parts of the questions? The yeah, how many CBP officers Chair, Chair, and how much? Uh, yeah. uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, with all due respect, if you can address it to him, copy to me. I'd be happy to do that. <laughs> Thank you. We will now recognize uh, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. McCall, for five minutes. Thank the chairman, Madam Secretary, welcome again. And um, uh, I, I want to commend you for your focus on the southwest border, uh, the resources you're putting uh, down there. I was in El Paso uh, two weeks ago and saw the, the best teams uh, in action, which, you know, we've, we're doing a pretty good job, I think, screening incoming traffic now. 
uh, I think one of the flaws has been tracking, you know, out, you know, going uh, cargo, currency, weapons going into Mexico. Uh, it's really a Mexican responsibility, and, and they have not stepped up to the plate. Uh, but I think these best teams are, are working uh, effectively with the dogs. Um, I'd like to see more infrastructure, quite frankly, and resources put into that because um, right now they're operating more on gut instinct, I think, more than anything else. Uh, the dogs are, are effective. Uh, may, perhaps the Merida initiative could provide some funding to Mexico so they could properly screen uh, incoming traffic. Um, but that's just a, those are my thoughts. I wanted to uh, hit uh, one issue specifically with you, and that's a state uh, criminal alien assistance program. Um, this provides assistance to the states uh, for incarceration of criminal aliens. And it's, in my view, been a very successful uh, program. I know when you testified last February before the um, Senate Finance Committee, uh, you stated that the federal government must, as, at a minimum, live up to its financial obligations to compensate for the cost of these failures uh, borne by the states. And you uh, referred to this program as an underfunded program and that um, the federal government needs to pay its bills. Um, the, this president's uh, budget uh, eliminates the SCAP program. And I just wanted to get your uh, view. Uh, you seem very supportive of it as a governor. What is your view on the president uh, now eliminating uh, this important program? Uh, Representative, uh, yes, in fact, when I was governor, I think I sent the Attorney General of the United States an invoice uh, for an unpaid uh, SCAT bill. Uh, states were getting, I think, about a, a 10 cents to the dollar. These are, this is a program that reimburses states for the cost of incarceration of uh, illegals. Um, uh, as you know, that's part of the Department of Justice budget. Um, at the Department of Homeland uh, Security level, I, I think what I'm trying to do is to reduce the number of illegals that come into those border states. Uh, and that's the way to reduce the costs on the states, not just for incarceration, but a whole host of other r related issues. Mm -hmm. uh, so with that, I'm, I'm sure the administration will be happy uh, at the DOJ level to discuss uh, SCAP and its, uh, how it was not budgeted uh, with you. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think at this point in my role, my, my uh, emphasis has to be on reducing the number of illegals, period. And, and I agree uh, with that in part. I, I do think elimination of this important program, though, is a mistake. And I, I think you're going to see uh, in the appropriations process or through maybe amendments on the floor this program being restored, as it was last Congress. Um, also, the uh, Stone Garden program is very important uh, uh, to me in terms of the, uh, the resources provided to state and locals, border sheriffs. The National Association of Border Sheriffs came out with a figure of about 500 million uh, it was the number that they believe they needed uh, to properly secure the border. I think they play an important part. As you said, state and locals are the eyes and ears. Um, 60 million is in the budget, which is a good start. Um, Congressman Cuellar and I introduced a bill to, to fully fund this, in our view, at the $500 million uh, dollar level. And I hope you'll give that some consideration. Uh, yes, uh, uh, Congressman, and, and we have started a, a bi-weekly conference call with border sheriffs and police chiefs, so we hear directly from them, particularly as we are in this uh, effort, and we want to sustain this effort at the southwest border. Okay. And I commend you on your choice of Mr. Burson for the border czar. He, is a, he briefed us uh, personally. He's a, a former U.S. attorney like yourself. Uh, he gets it. Uh, I've talked to him about uh, this particular program and the, the 500 million. I think he's very, uh, uh, he seemed at least to be very supportive of the idea of, of doing that. Um, lastly, if you could just give us an update on Guantanamo. Uh, I went down there with other members. Um, there, you know, the top 16 Al Qaeda leaders are there. Uh, there's a grave concern from our constituents about these people coming into the United States. Uh, at, at some point. I know you're on the task force, and if you could give the committee an update on that, I would appreciate it. Uh, yes, Congressman. Uh, 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 Department of Homeland Security is on the task force. It's chaired by the Attorney General. Mm -hmm. uh, it is uh, looking in inmate by inmate at Gitmo in terms of uh, what uh, disposition should be made. Um, uh, if any are ultimately decided to come into the United States, um, uh, that they are paroled in under, the, uh, under ICE, uh, for example, 
uh, my number one concern and uh, number one uh, function, I think, is to make sure it is in such a fashion that uh, Americans can be confident that they will not be uh, they will not be endangered by that. So we are looking at what kinds of restrictions would need to uh, be associated with any sort of movement. Thank you. I see my time has expired. Thank you. We now recognize the young lady from. We'll get a uh, gentleman from California. We'll get to you next. Gentleman lady from Arizona, Ms. Kirkpatrick. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Secretary, as you know very well, we in Arizona are extremely concerned about smuggling across our border, along with the potential for the type of violence we have witnessed in Mexico. I have been calling for Congress to authorize $100 million to prevent the southbound trafficking of cash and guns. And last month, I introduce, introduced a bill, along with Chairman Thompson, which could do just that. Therefore, I am really glad to see your budget proposal calls for almost exactly the funding I requested to improve CBP and ICE southbound interdic interdiction operations. When do you expect to have all of the additional CBP officers, Border Patrol agents, ICE agents, and license plate readers fully in place to prevent southbound trafficking? Do you have a timeline for that? Representative, uh, yes, virtually all of those resources have moved already down to the southwest border um, as part of our effort to assist the government of Mexico in, in halting the flow of the fuel for the cartels uh, in, into, into, into the country. In addition, um, and this in a way refers back to Representative McCall's uh, point, uh, we are working with the gov government of Mexico and the Minister of Interior, Gomez Mott, to set up a system whereby they actually do some southbound inspections themselves. Uh, and uh, we have some exchange in terms of rotation and all the like, so, so the uh, cartels don't know uh, who's, who's working which area um, at at any given time. That, that planning is underway as well. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Um, as you also know, uh, we have just started the wildfire season in the West, and we've seen the devastating effects of a wildfire in California. And I just got word this morning that there's a wildfire near Highway 60 in Springerville in my district. So I'm very happy to see the funding uh, for the safer grants. Uh, my question is that uh, which, with the new funding, are you looking to have a cap on this grant increased? If so, do you have any thoughts as to what would be an appropriate level? I'd have to get back to you on that, Representative. I don't know the answer. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Secretary. I yield back my time. Thank you. Uh, let me apologize to the gentleman from California. Staff had omitted your Thank name you. uh, on the list uh, for uh, members present. And uh, so we now recognize the gentleman from California for five minutes. I appreciate Mr. it, Mr. Longer. Chairman. I have lost 10 pounds. I know it's more difficult to see me now, so I appreciate <laughs> that. Uh, Madam Secretary, first of all, let me reiterate uh, what uh, the gentleman from Texas said. Alan Burson's an excellent uh, choice. I worked with him uh, when he was in San Diego. Uh, he works with both sides of the aisle, and he has a very good understanding of the border, and thank you for uh, making that selection. Uh, secondly, um, Thank you very much for your commitment in this budget and in the meetings that I've had with representatives of your office in the White House on cybersecurity. That is an unmet need in this country. You're recognizing that in part by the budget that you have presented, and I appreciate that. One of the areas I hope to talk with you at some other time, both you and Department of Defense and others, is EMP, electromagnetic pulse, whether we're taking that seriously, uh, whether that's just the old Cold War concern or whether in view of the fact that we have rogue nations now that have um, uh, lifting power with uh, new missiles, so you don't have to have an accurate missile to have the impact of uh, EMP and what that means for our uh, um, protection of our, our infrastructure. Are we even preparing for that, and is that part of your concern? I would reiterate my concern about the SCAP program. When I was Attorney General, I worked hard for it. When you were Attorney General, you worked hard for it. When you were Governor, you worked hard for it. I doubt the facts have changed. I doubt your opinion has changed. I understand you're part of a team now, but hopefully you can voice the concerns the rest of us have. We're building, uh, we're building uh, airports where nobody flies. We're building uh, bridges to nowhere. 
I mean, stuff that you can't give a justification for the federal government. But you know and I know the primary responsibility for immigration and for border control is the federal government. And when they don't do the job, and those of us in the states have a considerable number of illegal aliens who've committed felonies, it is a legitimate request for the states to have the federal government assist in that. And yet we zero that out in the president's budget. So I'm not going to put you on the spot because I know where you have been. And no facts have changed. So I doubt you've changed your opinion. Um, maybe they'll listen to you a little bit more on that. Let, let me focus on, on Gitmo, though. Um, as an attorney who's clerked on the Ninth Circuit, been a U.S. attorney, attorney general, you understand that when we bring people to the United States to put us on American property, American soil, that connection gives rise to constitutional protections they might not otherwise have anywhere else. So if we close Guantanamo and we bring them here, all of a sudden they have an assortment of rights, which may mean, according to federal judges, they are released. They are released into our communities. Now you have said today you are concerned about that and you want to make sure that we protect Americans. We have members of the cabinet who have said in other positions, uh, Secretary Salazar and Secretary um, Sebelius, that they don't want folks in their states. I don't know what your position is about whether Arizona ought to be willing to take them, but a whole lot of people aren't running to, to take these folks. What I'd like to know with some particularity is what do you mean when you say it is your concern that we protect the American people? Because if you have people who are terrorists and we're holding them overseas, you don't necessarily have the basis upon which to bring them to trial because the purpose of detaining terrorists on the battlefield is to stop them from carrying out their function. You may not be able to prove a completed crime. But yet, if we bring them to American soil, they may have the right to be released under our federal laws and our Constitution. So I am at a quandary to find out what you mean by how we would protect the American people if we bring people who are suspected terrorists because of decisions by federal courts, because they've been brought to the United States, they're allowed out in the community, how do we protect? What does that mean? Uh, thank you, uh, Representative. Um, uh, first of all, I think uh, the President's been very clear. We need to close Gitmo, which itself has become a recruiting tool uh, for terrorists. Um, how we do that uh, is uh, been the subject of the review chaired by the Attorney General that, that the Department of Homeland Se Security sits on. My statement was, well, what is, what is Homeland Security's function there? And our function there is to provide uh, information and, uh, and assistance as to what sorts of protections would be needed uh, on, the home, in the, on the homeland side if an inmate were ultimately to be released to the homeland. Um, those decisions uh, have not yet been made. Uh, they are reviewing each case independently. Obviously, there are other places and other facilities and other ways to um, deal with well, I, I understand. What I'd like, like to know, can you give me some idea of what those other ways or other ideas are? Because frankly, we're left now with talking with our constituents saying the administration has taken the position. And if I were in court, I, I could debate with you whether Gitmo has been a positive or a negative. But the fact of the matter is the President's made a decision. We've been telling now the American people we're going to close Guantanamo. I don't see any money in the budget to do that, but that's another thing. And that's going to force people here in the United States. Federal judges may very well release them, as you've suggested, that could happen. But what, what are the options? What kinds of things are you looking at in your department to assist us in protecting the American people? So we can tell our constituents what we're going to do. Uh, Representative, I think uh, right now we're treading into uh, an area that I don't believe I'm able to, to talk about in a public setting. Uh, this is a process that is underway at the highest levels uh, with the White House and other departments. Um, but uh, as decisions are made, the President's committed to transparency and there will be explanations about what is happening and why. Thank you. Uh, gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Pasquale, is recognized for five minutes. Madam Secretary, uh, I appreciate fully uh, the difficult job you have of uh, creating a budget that meets the needs of 
this nation in all the various areas which you have, you're in charge of during a, a tough economic period in our history. I understand that. Believe me, I do. I, I've concluded, though, that looking at what you proposed, what you proposed to us and the nation, the last administration made the mistake of not understanding that real homeland security starts from the ground up in our local streets, in our intelligence apparatus, and not here in Washington. Uh, I sincerely hope this administration doesn't make the same mistake. Um, I have to say, I'm greatly dismayed, to say the least, to see the dramatic cuts to uh, a couple of grant programs that are vital to our local and state first responders who we keep on patting on the back, and yet this budget, I believe, does not reflect what our rhetoric has been. Under this budget proposal, the successful fire grant program uh, is cut by 70 percent from last year. We simply can't hire thousands of new firefighters to departments knowing what the regulations are under the SAFER bill, which I was co-sponsor of as well, because they're not going to have the equipment to training. We did not pass the FIRE Act after 9-11. We passed the FIRE Act before 9-11. We do, as the gentleman from New York stated very specifically, have three billion dollars in requests every year. Former administration tried to zero this program out. It's been a successful program in red districts, pink districts, blue districts, you name them, all across America. We had those needs about equipment and training and the wellness of our firefighters, be they career or voluntary, long before 9-11. They were neglected part of the public safety equation. They've always been neglected. In fact, there was a debate as to whether we have any responsibility at all with regard. But towns and municipalities were not meeting their obligations. They couldn't afford to. So here's a program. Listen to the ingredients. It's competitive. It deals with needs. You've got to prove it. Uh, it's peer supervised. Wow, that's something very unique. Uh, there is oversight. It's fair. The money goes directly to the local community. The states can't cream it off, take it off the top. That's different, isn't it? It doesn't go through the state. And it's results oriented. So the firefighters and police officers who I have dear to my heart, they're the first to respond at a natural catastrophe or a man-made disaster. They're the first that will be there. The budget also only provides $50 million for the Interoperable Emergency Communications Grant Program. That's an 85 percent decrease in funds. Now, when you're saying, by the way, that the money is in the recovery plan, let me inform you. Madam Secretary, that there are $210 million in that recovery plan. It all went to construction of firehouses. Had nothing to do, basically, with the Fire Act. Nothing to do with equipment, nothing to do with training, nothing to do with apparatus. I voted for the Recovery Act. I hope I know what's in there. Mr. Reichert and I worked very hard as chairman and ranking, ranking member of the subcommittee in the 109th Congress to create the great grant program because the lack of interoperable 
equipment was one of the clearest failures of 9-11 and still is, still is. So the last time you were before this committee, Madam Secretary, there was no bigger supporter of local and state grant programs than you. And again, I want to stress that I understand, and I would like you to respond to both of these questions, if I may, Mr. Chairman, through the chair and through the ranking member, I'd like you to respond to that. I was talking with staff just a minute ago, so I apologize, but I'm confused on your, your statement about the interoperability of 50 million. It, uh, it is my understanding that it is level funded in the FY10 budget, so. There's a decrease in the IECGP part of the uh, Homeland Security budget. No, sir. Well, then we're looking at the budget incorrectly. I'm gladly go back and I'll stand corrected if so. It says I have going back to FY08, 50 million, FY09, uh, 50 million, uh, FY10 request, 50 million. Can we, we'll talk about that privately. Would you go, we'll talk about that. I have different numbers than you have. Um, and uh, as I explained earlier on the fire grants, I couldn't agree more about fire and the importance of the first responders and the whole context of Homeland Security. Uh, uh, the uh, fire grants historically have been uh, heavily funded. As you noted, uh, the money for fire- Excuse me, I didn't hear what you just have said. Been, have been heavily funded uh, historically. Uh, they, they haven't been heavily funded. Sir. If, there, if we have $3 billion of requests every year and we have between 500 and 700 million, they're not heavily funded as far as I'm concerned. What I'm trying to suggest, sir, is that in the past uh, there's been uh, an appropriation there. Part of that appropriation, if we want to look at FY10 as a continuation, was assumed in the Stimulus Act. Now, as you correctly note, Stimulus Act was for construction of fire stations. I do not know whether local fire departments then are moving some of their capital budget there and moving their money around, uh, but they are getting additional monies uh, there. And, the, and our information was, and uh, meeting with uh, first responders was, in this time of limited economic resources, uh, they were concerned about personnel and they wanted more money for the personnel side of the budgets. And that's what the FY10 request yeah. does. We look forward uh, to working with you. Time, time has, has expired. And I'm sure the gentleman will have other questions that the Secretary can answer. We now recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Dent. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and I had a few questions, uh, Madam Secretary, with respect to chemical plant security, but I did want to follow up on a couple things that have been said. Uh, first, um, uh, Ranking Member King uh, mentioned in his opening remarks uh, about the, uh, the right-wing extremism report, and I'd be remiss if I didn't take this opportunity to express uh, my disappointment in the now infamous report, which indicated that a returning veterans might be more susceptible to radicalization. Uh, to your credit, you've openly ad admitted that the report did not go through as robust review process as you had hoped. Uh, could you tell us where the wheels came off the wagon, so to speak, and um, what you're doing to keep this from happening again? Yes, uh, the wheels came off the wagon, uh, uh, first of all, because uh, the vetting process that existed within the department was not followed or resolved. Secondly, the report was distributed um, uh, and it was not authorized to be distributed. And third, it was distributed more broadly, even if there had been an authorization, than it should have been. Um, the report, uh, that particular section was meant to say, uh, not that uh, veterans are more uh, susceptible uh, to become radicalized, but they are certainly targets of recruitment. And that is well known, and there are many publications that say that. Nonetheless, the way it was written or perceived was offensive, and I apologize for that. I apologize again. Mm -hmm. Internally, what we have done now is to uh, put a, a process in place to make sure that products of the department are properly vetted and supervised uh, before they can be authorized to be distributed at all. Uh, and let me say, uh, Representative, my view is that where our department needs to focus is not on the kind of intel and analysis that circulates around Washington, D.C., but things that are useful for state and local law enforcement uh, on the ground. Uh, and too much, I think, of what we produce is kind of Washington, D.C. speak as opposed to something that really works for state and local. 
So one of the, the, the things I hope to accomplish as the secretary is to kind of re review, rethink uh, that whole intel uh, uh, support that we are supposed to be providing for security. Thank you. And, uh, and also to follow up on Mr. Lundgren's question uh, regarding the particularities of the Gitmo closing and relocation of prisoners, uh, you indicated that uh, you cannot talk about uh, such specifics in a, in a public setting. Uh, would you be willing to hold a classified briefing for members uh, of this committee on the details of Gitmo? Uh, sir, uh, we'll, we'll work with your staff on that and on the timing of that. I simply do not know. Uh, it may be that the White House itself would like to do the briefing still, but we'll follow up with because, you. Because I think the, many members of the committee like, would like to be briefed on that. Thank you. Uh, also, I just wanted to mention, too, I, I wanted to first at the outset commend the department uh, for a job well done with its current regulations with respect to uh, chemical plant security. Um, the regulations, as you know, the industry doesn't love them. The environmentalists uh, uh, don't like them either, uh, which means you're probably on to something here. Uh, so the department's authorization for regulating chemical facilities expires in October this year. Uh, the department has asked in its budget submission to Congress for a one-year extension of this regulatory authority. Uh, the committee is currently engaged in negotiations on possible chemical security legislation that would address this extension, but the legislation would do more than extend the current regulation. Uh, some in Congress uh, are considering including provisions that would require the department to assess uh, chemical facility processes at tens of thousands of chemical uh, plants and identify what inherently safer technologies or processes might be appropriate in each situation. What are your thoughts on Congress requiring the department to determine which processes and chemicals facilities should utilize? Uh, we'd be happy to work with you on that. In, in part, we're, we're sort of doing that now uh, as we implement the CFAPS uh, rules and regs. Uh, so there, there may be a very useful overlap now. Yeah, because there are some concerns about secondary effects of some requirements that might come out of the committee on commerce overall. And then we get into this issue of inherently safer technologies and processes. These are engineering practices. Uh, and and I, know in, I noticed in the uh, President's budget request included an additional $19 million for the Office of Infrastructure Protection to increase chemical faci um, facility security. Uh, has the Department examined how much it would cost to bring on necessary expertise review thousands of these IST assessments and make determinations as, as to their feasibility. I think this is a very expensive uh, and it requires a great deal of expertise and I'm just concerned the department would not have that level of expertise and you have 19 million in the budget. Can you just address that by any chance? Yes, sir. Uh, we do have a, a kind of a spend plan associated with what it will take to implement uh, the CFATS regulations and the budget uh, is reflective of that. We'd be happy to provide you with more detail. Yeah, and if they could too, is any of the 19 million designed to bring on any IST specialists uh, onto, onto your staff? Uh, we'll, we'll follow up with you on that, absolutely. Okay, and, uh, and I see my time has expired, so thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Madam Secretary, um, uh, to clear up Mr. Pasquale's issue, uh, there's 400 million authorized in that account of which only 50 has been requested each year. So that was the discrepancy in the numbers uh, that he had reference to. Uh, we now will hear from the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Madam Secretary, thank you for, for being here. Um, I'm not sure whether or not this hearing is being televised on C-SPAN or not, uh, but in the event it is, I think it is extremely important for me and frankly for all of us to, to uh, hear you respond to something based on a question that, or statement made earlier. Uh, I uh, represent uh, Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, Kansas City is 19 miles from Fort Leavenworth, which is in another state, but it's but uh, the city limit is right, uh, just 19 miles away. I don't want anyone to believe, unless you say differently, that even if those pr pr uh, prisoners were found to be illegally imprisoned, that they will be taken down to Main Street in Kansas City, Missouri, or any other city, and released. Uh, uh, is it not? true that that uh, person who was illegally in this country 
and arrested, uh, whether they were found guilty or not, would be deported. Am I correct? Sir, let me just uh, say, uh, this, is a, this is a hearing on the FY10 budget request. I just don't think it, uh, I, understand. I can speak to the Gitmo issues uh, in, in I, a I public understand. setting like this. I understand, I don't want you to, and I don't want to, I don't want you to speak to it, and I don't want to come to a, a, a secret meeting. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, 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 I fear that when we mm -hmm. make statements in a public setting that causes people in the public to believe these people may be turned loose on our streets, when I know as a non-lawyer that that's not true. And I, I just had, had the need to, to say that. I don't, I don't want to talk about any other details. I'm concerned about sending out bad information. And I'm 100% correct as a non-lawyer that I'm correct. Now, I, the, I would just prefer uh, not to comment I, at this time. Yeah, I don't. I, thank you. I, I've editorialized. <laughs> uh, my c concern is about the um, E-Verify uh, program, which I'm assuming is under ICE, budgeted under ICE. Is that? I believe so. Yes. 17. It was 112 million requested for E-Verify. Yes. Uh, uh, early on, I guess in, in 1997 when the program first started, there were questions about its accuracy and so forth. Uh, it is my understanding that m most, if not all of those problems have been corrected. Uh, yes, sir. And, and, and let me just say, as governor of Arizona, I signed uh, probably the nation's toughest in employer sanctions law, uh, which basically um, gave an incentive to employers to use E-Verify. We used it extensively through state government, uh, and it gets better and better uh, all the time, and it's a very easy uh, system to use. Is it possible for uh, someone on, on your staff or uh, uh, who can, can run, at least me, I, there may be other members who would like to, to become familiar with it so that we can better answer questions uh, back in our district. Absolutely, we'd be happy to give you a demonstration. I, I would, I would appreciate that, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and uh, I, I appreciate your presence. I, I will yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the committee. We'll take one other member, uh, Mr. Bill Arrakis, for five minutes. We'll recess. We have three votes. Uh, reconvene uh, shortly after the third vote. Secretary is scheduled to be with us until 12.30. That's correct, sir. Uh, and so we'll go uh, until 12.30. Uh, Mr. Bill Arrakis, for five Thank minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it very much. Welcome, Madam Secretary. I believe we should do everything in our power to ensure that employers are not hiring illegal aliens, especially when it comes to Homeland Security contracts. And again, on V-Verify. I received a letter from the uh, Assistant Secretary of Legislative Affairs on April 17th regarding the use of stimulus funds by the department, which says DHS gives preference to prospective contractors based on the extent to which they use E-Verify. I have several questions, a couple questions anyhow on this. Does this mean that the department reframes from awarding contracts to employers that do not use E-Verify or just prioritizes contracts for those that do and do you believe that the use of E-Verify should be mandatory, mandatory for government contractors and subcontractors doing business with, the, with DHS? Uh, Representative, uh, I believe E-Verify needs to be an integral part of our immigration law enforcement uh, moving forward. Uh, the system needs to be easy to use. It needs to be efficient uh, for prospective uh, employers and employees because uh, we don't want people unfairly uh, denied uh, work uh, because of E-Verify, but I believe that we will uh, be increasing E-Verify's capacity, capability. Uh, I believe that um, uh, in the White House is now considering the rule about all contractors for the federal government with respect to Department of Homeland Security. Um, I do not know of uh, contracts that uh, do not provide for the use of E-Verify. Okay, how about uh, why is there a delay by the administration? Uh, can you answer that question? I think the concern was uh, whether the capacity of the E-Verify system 
was big enough to handle a universal rule on all contractors or whether it would actually that requirement would delay stimulus money getting out of the economy and jobs being created ok can you estimate as to when the program will be implemented let me just i believe the next deadline is in june and we'll get back to you on on that but the matter is with in the white house looking at capacity through all agencies to implement ok thank you very much gentlemen you back thank you uh... well the next person is mr green uh... if you promise not to take but two minutes okay. gentleman from texas thank you mr minutes. chairman and thank you madam secretary for appearing I, I want to congratulate you, and I want to say to you that I will also pray for you. I trust that things will go well. Uh, you have a, a great history. You are a real patriot, and uh, the country is blessed to have you, and uh, we look forward to working with you. Thank I will go to page 19 of what I believe has been distributed uh, as the proposed budget. Um, and uh, on that page, under transportation threat assessment and credentialing, there's an indication that we have $216 million for this. That's a 37% increase. And the indication is that 53, excuse me, I'll shut this down. Uh, we have uh, 53.3 million, uh, which is a, the increase that uh, we will have for this area. And I want to just read the last sentence, which is what I agree with. Uh, given the past problems associated with the TWIC program, it is highly recommended that TSA use these funds to improve the efficiency and timeliness of the program. I just want you to know I agree completely with that sentence because the TWIC card has been a subject of some discussion at the committee level. And with that, I will yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the committee stands in recess uh, for three votes, and we will reconvene shortly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman.